Hi there. Thank you for joining me today for our session in the book of Romans. We are in chapter 2. We're going to start at verse 6 and go down to the end of verse 17. This is a very powerful scripture. We're going to learn about the wrath of God and we're going to learn about how that happens. We're also going to learn how we can live out of our heart rather than out of the physical things that are around us. And we're going to have a very powerful lesson on how Jesus reaches out to us and offers to us the forgiveness of sin, but it's incumbent upon us to reach out and to receive it. If we don't, then it tells us that we are going to be judged, our, man, our secrets are going to be judged through Jesus as the, as the gospel declares. And if, our, if we don't have that relationship with Jesus, then it's not going to be a wonderful time. So let's come and let's learn about this so that we don't come to that day of judgment and find ourselves wanting. Once again, thank you for joining me on our sessions in the book of Romans. As I mentioned already, we are in Romans chapter 2, starting in verse 6. I'm just going to back up one verse just so that we can get a little bit of continuity as to what's happening here, maybe even two verses here. It says in verse four, or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, tolerance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness leads you towards repentance? Because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath when his righteous judgment will be revealed. God will give each person according to what he has done. So this makes it very clear here to us that there is a repentance that comes to us by understanding the tolerance and love of God. But because of the stubborn and unrepentant heart, there is wrath being stored up for us. And in verse 6 here, where, where we are starting today, he says, God will give each person according to what he has done. It's always dependent on us, isn't it? It's dependent on us because we have the freedom of choice. And whatever choices we make are going to result in how we live our life. And that's also going to result in what kind of judgment we see. God has given us every opportunity to choose righteousness. He's given us every opportunity through Jesus to come to a place where we can walk with him and we can enjoy our fellowship with him. But as it mentions here, that... Many people, because of the hardness of their heart, because of stubbornness within them, because they, they refuse to repent, are building up for themselves wrath on the day of God. I know there's a lot of controversy out there right now about the wrath of God, and many people think that many of the disasters that happen and many of the things that happen around the world is God's wrath being visited on the people. You know, there may be an aspect of that, but from what I can understand from the scriptures, his wrath has been set aside until the end of time. There's a difference between the old covenant and the new covenant, where God's wrath would visit up upon the people under the old covenant, but under the new covenant, Jesus has taken away the punishment from us, and he's taken away the wrath until the end comes. It's the whole point of why Jesus came was to take away the punishment from us, to take away sin from us, to take away the consequences of all this so that we could be freed from sin, so that we could be freed from any wrath of God, so that we could walk in relationship with God. That's his desire for us. That's his, that's his biggest heart for us is to walk in this relationship with him. He continues on in verse 7, he says, To those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honor, and immorality, he will have eternal life. But those who are self-seeking, who reject the truth, follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. He's given us two very clear pathways that we can choose in our life here. If by persistence we do good, seeking glory, honor, and immorality, we will have eternal life. 
Now, of course, the glory and the honor are not for us, but as God gives glory and honor to us, we give it back to him, right? We give that honor and glory to him because he's the one who is deserving, not us. But for those who are self-seeking, who reject the truth and follow evil, who are looking for glory themselves, you know, who, who are rejecting the things of God and following evil, there will be anger and wrath. But it's not at this point that we see the anger and wrath, but it is coming at the day in the end when, when there's going to be judgment, right? Verse 9, he goes on, There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil, first for the Jews and then for the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good, first for the Jews and for the Gentiles. For God does not show favoritism. Well, Paul is making it very clear here. It doesn't matter whether you're a Jew or a Gentile. It doesn't matter who you are. The same thing is going to apply for all people. If, if you are living a life of relationship with God, if you are walking with God, you're going to receive glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good. First for the Jews and then for the Gentiles. But there will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil. First for the Jew and then for the Gentile. It's up to us. Now, the thing we have to be careful of here, we can become so sin conscious if, if we just take these few scriptures by themselves and just, just focus on them. As we read through, especially this book of Romans, we're going to see how Paul is talking about the attitude of our heart. Because under the old covenant, everything was about performance. It was about don't do this or do this or don't do that or do that or do this. You know, there were things that you had to do in order to, to keep the law. Under the new covenant, it's about the hard attitude. Jesus made this clear in Matthew when he said, you know, the law says that you shall not kill. But I tell you, even if you hate your brother, you have, you have already committed murder. You know, the law says you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you, if you look at somebody lustfully, you have already committed uh, adultery with them. So a, there's a difference between the physical application of the sin and the heart attitude. Now, we know that all sin starts in the heart or in the mind. You start thinking, you start thinking about sin. You, you will never sin if you don't think about it. But we always think about these things and then, and then it becomes a manifestation in, in our life. We can control our thinking and take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, then we're not tempted with the sin that the devil comes with us. Because the devil doesn't make us sin. He just puts temptation in our mind. He just gets our mind thinking about things. And then next thing you know, we're participating in those things. Now, verse 11 here is so powerful to me. It says, for God does not show favoritism. He's chosen not to show favoritism between the Jew and the Gentile anymore. Now, this wasn't the case under the Old Covenant. I mean, the Old Covenant was for the Jewish people. And God's heart was for the Jewish people. And when we get to Romans chapter 11, we're going to see that his heart is still for the Jewish people. But he also includes the Gentiles. So that when Jesus came and died on the cross and was resurrected again, that it was not only for the Jewish people, but it was for all of us. It was for everyone. And so that's why he's saying here, it doesn't matter whether you're Jew or Gentile. If you leave a life of evil and of sin uh, separated from God, then you're going to receive the just punishment. You're going to receive uh, the anger and the wrath of God. But if you lead a, a God-fearing life, if, if you lead a life not of evil, but of peace and in relationship with God through Jesus, then you are going to be promoted. You're going to be glorified, honored, and peace for everyone. You'll have eternal life. Amen. Verse 12 says, All who sin apart from the law will also perish apart from the law. And all who sin under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but it is those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. Indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law, they are a law for themselves, even though they do not have the law, since they show that the requirements of the law are written in their hearts, and their conscience are bearing witness, their thoughts now accusing, now even defending them. 
This will take place on the day when God will judge man's secret through Jesus, as his gospel declares. We can see here that if we sin apart from the law, we also perish apart from the law. But all who sin under the law will be judged by the law. It doesn't matter whether we follow the law or we follow the heart of God. We are going to be judged by the standard in which we look at, right? For a Jewish person, they're going to be judged according to the law if they put themselves under the law. Of course, we know what happens when you judge yourself according to the law. The word tells us very clearly that in the law, if you sin in one law, you are guilty of all the laws. And if you go back and you study, you see that the Jewish people had 613 laws that they had to keep. So if one of those things you did not do or you did something that was forbidden under that law, under those 613 laws, then you were guilty of the whole law. He's saying here, it doesn't matter whether you're Jew or Gentile, it depends on your heart. Where is your heart? In verse 14, indeed, when the Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law, they are a law for themselves, even though they do not have the law. Since they show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts, their conscience are also bearing witness, and their thoughts now accusing, now even defending. So he's talking about our heart. This is, this is the greatest difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. The Old Covenant was more of a physical thing. It was more of a physical performance. Where under the New Covenant, it's all about the heart. It's about what is our heart attitude? What's going on in our heart, right? It's a lot easier just to keep a written law and rules and regulations than it is to be led by the heart. You know, many of us would like to get up in the morning and look on our fridge and see a list of things that God wants us to do. But if that was the case, then it wouldn't be by the heart, would it? And that's what God wants it to be. He wants it to be by the heart. We need to live by the heart, by the, by the attitude of our heart, right? Our heart has to be right. Wherever our heart is, there is that manifestation that comes out in our body and in our being. And so we can always see what the heart of a person is, is because it's being manifested in their life. You can't keep your heart one way and then manifest in your life a different way. You can for a short time. But in the overall, people are going to see whether you are, in fact, doing the things that you say or the things that are in your heart. Verse 16 says, This will take place on the day when God will judge men's secrets through Jesus, as my gospel declares. So that day, that judgment day, that day of wrath is going to come when God will judge men's secret through Jesus, as my gospel declares. Do you have Jesus in your heart or do you not? Because this is what it comes down to. And oftentimes there's a big debate, and, and I even ask people this question. I say, what sin can send you to hell? And, you know, oftentimes people list off, well, if you murder somebody, or if you hate somebody, or if you steal something. And these are all grievous sins. And if you're under the law, it doesn't really matter what you do. Any sin can send you to hell. But we're not under the law like this anymore. We have been set free from the law of sin and death. We have no longer have condemnation, as we're going to study once we get to uh, chapter 8 here in the book of Romans. What we are going to be judged on is whether we accept Jesus or not. Because this is the only sin that will send us to hell. If we refuse Jesus, if we refuse to accept the gift he has given to us, this is the only thing that can send us to hell. Because when we accept Jesus, his payment on the cross what he did for us in shedding his blood there wiped away all of our sin. All of our past sin, our future sin, our present sin. Every sin has been right to, wiped away. But not only for us, but for every person in the world. Oh, so you're saying that nobody's going to go to hell, that everybody's going to go to heaven. No, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, is that Jesus paid the price for this, every sin in the world from the time of Adam to the end of the world. Jesus paid the price for every sin. However, if we don't accept the payment that he has made, if we don't receive the gift that he is giving to us, then it doesn't work. We're not set free. There's a great example and story for us in John chapter 13, where Jesus is having his last supper with his disciples. And they're all reclining at the table there. The tables back then were 
you know, they were only about this high and they would sit on cushions and kind of lean against each other and they would just, it was a very casual thing, you know, it wasn't like sit down and eat quickly, it was a time of relaxing and enjoying your, your meal with your friends. And there was a, a Jewish custom at that time that if, if you were having a meal like that where it was a kind of a celebration thing and there was somebody there that had offended you and they had not asked for your forgiveness, you could take a piece of bread and dip it into something on the table and you could offer it to them. In doing that, you're saying, I am willing to forgive you. If they reached out and received what you were offering to them, then they're saying, please forgive me. And it brought reconciliation between these two people. And so now they were able to eat and enjoy the celebration in peace. When Jesus was reclining at the table with his disciples, he said to them, one of you is going to betray me. And of course, it caused a great stir amongst the disciples because these men had been working together for over three years and they've been traveling with Jesus and they've been through hard times and, and difficult times and seen many wonderful things happen at the same time. They were wondering who was it that was going to betray Jesus? Jesus was sitting there and John was kind of leaning up against him and Peter was kind of leaning up against John and Peter kind of leans over to John and says, ask him who it is. Who is it that's going to betray you? And so John leans over and he says to Jesus, who is it that's going to betray you? And Jesus takes a piece of bread and he dips it and he says, the one to whom I give this to, he is the one who's going to betray me. And so he handed it to Judas and Judas received it. What happened in that situation, Jesus was forgiving Judas even before he sinned against Jesus, even before he had betrayed him. Even though he had made an opportunity to betray him, he hadn't betrayed him yet. And so he dipped this in and he offered forgiveness to Judas. And this is what God does for us. This is what Jesus has done for us. He has dipped his body into his blood and he offers it to us as a forgiveness of sin. And if we accept that, if we take that thing, then we are being set free. And the only sin that, that can send us to hell is when we refuse the gift that he's given us. When we refuse, when the Holy Spirit is showing us what Jesus has done for us, when the Holy Spirit is showing us that we can be set free and we refuse, then there's no hope for us, right? There's no hope because it's only through Jesus. And that's why it says here, this will take place on the day when God will judge men's secret through Jesus Christ as my gospel declares. Well, our time's come to an end today, and I, I sure hope that that's been a, a blessing for you. It is so powerful when we understand that Jesus offers to us the forgiveness of sin, and it's up to us to reach out and to take it. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time that we could spend together. Father, we thank you for your word. We know, Lord, that there is a day coming when judgment and wrath will be there. But it says that you will judge men's secrets through Jesus Christ as your gospel declares, and Father, we know that Jesus is living in us, that we have accepted him, and so we come to you without fear, without uh, nervousness as to what's going to happen in judgment, because we know that Jesus has paid the price for our sin, and we know that we walk with him and we walk with you. And for that, we are truly thankful that we can have this assurance that is in us, just as it, as it says earlier in what we've read here today, that our conscience bears witness and that our, even our thoughts are, are, are defending us and defending the, what's in our heart. And Lord, we just thank you that through Jesus we have this opportunity to be your children. And we know we are your children because your spirit identifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And we just thank you for that. Father, we just pray for those who are searching, who are looking for something. Lord, we just pray that they would see what you have done for us through Jesus, who has given us life. And we just thank you for everything that, is, that he has done for us. We know it's because of the love you have for us, and we accept and receive that love that you have for us. And we just thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be able to share your word. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining me today. I look forward to the next session. Remember, God loves you, and so do I. Okay, girls, take us home.